So we're going to go to our first talk of the afternoon, and that's Tammy Lister. Uh, yep, thank you. She's, her talk is The Art of Product. And I was telling her earlier that she doesn't need an introduction because everybody knows Tammy, and she insists it's not true. But I'm saying it is true. I'm sure everybody's heard of Tammy. She is, uh, I'll, give, I'll give the actual bio, but a product creator focusing on WordPress. She has a hybrid background across product design, psychology, and development. She contributes to WordPress and is passionate about open source, community, and drinking tea. So everybody help me welcome Tammy. So thank you. You most likely have your own definition of what is art and what is product. And everyone has different backgrounds and bring those into this room, into this talk. Myself, I spend my days creating products in collaboration with others and also empowering others to create. And my own background is a hybrid one, also in roots in art. And this talk is one which is actually quite personal because I've gained that perspective from art that I've brought into making product, and that's what I'd like to share today. I want to begin by looking at what is art and what is product, and then how art is created, and where the differences are, and moving on to where the similarities are. And I'm going to end with sharing how when creating products, we can benefit from the practices in creating art. But this all starts with some definitions. So, spoiler. It's not easy to define art. There are countless arguments and debates strewn across courses and essays and academic halls around this. If you study art, months and months are spent trying to answer what is art and actually eventually coming to the answer that no one really can define that and there's a lack of definition. But it doesn't stop that or we shouldn't pause there and give up. There is a way to start having an understanding in a common language and that's really around what is and what isn't. So Sister Wendy's quote focuses a bit more on what art can be and can encompass and the boundaries of that practice. And there's a better definition of taste and whereas the what art debates tend to get more complex and fun and long, it really is uh, easier to do this because art is wide, covering a lot of the beholder's perspective. Product, on the other hand, is more narrow, is easier to define. It has a more precise application. However, the concept is offered here, particularly where market is quite wide. Similarly, the desire piece of this can be interesting to dive into. A product is made available for market, and you reach a desire or a need, and that is far more than the exact or the creation aspect of art. And it's worth also defining, and I want to be very clear here, that art isn't design. You can think about it in these terms, and of course there's going to be some debate that always is amongst these things. Design requires a function, and art does not. Art can have a function, but it doesn't require one. Design is results-driven, and art doesn't need to be. Again, it can be, though, and some artists create boundaries on purpose. So now we've looked at, or I've tried to come to some understanding of how I'm going to be framing this, at least with some of these definitions, I want to move into considering the creative processes. How do things get even made in art? And then we can move on to products. Art is a process, uh, not a product, is a very bold quote to particularly add to this. But what does it mean, though? A process is something you go through. It's not an object. It's a flow often not focused on the end result. In many sense, art is just doing. There's a phrase that you might have heard before, art for art's sake. After all, there is importance in both. Value, there is value in the creative space. And if we create products without creative space, process or that lack of input, they lack. We can all sense that. We've all had or used those products that have that. There's a feeling of function without heart or consideration. And when there's too much creating or uh, too much art or too much consideration, uh, this creative overworking, we've also tried to use products that have had that and experienced products either side of those scale. 
So this could be a scene as a visualization of the creative process. You start, things kind of happen, and they're often oblique and not transparent, maybe a little frenzied, and at the end is a piece of art. Ta-da! That's not a very satisfactory process, though, right? Since you can't really learn from this, you can't really get any meaning from this at all. The messy middle is truly messy if it's seen like this. Some play on this almost mystical nature of this creative process, um, wanting it to seem this illusion of grandiose. That said, it is a process, so let's look a little bit more into what it can be defined as. So defining the creative process isn't new, and many have done it even in studies. Mason Ward in 2002 conducted interviews with artists and developed a process model for art making with these four steps. Artwork conception, idea development, making the artwork an idea, development and finishing the artwork. In declaring the process, they claimed the most, that most artists actually used a process. They weren't the first to define, and they certainly aren't going to be the last to do that. But their work had some really interesting aspects when we're looking at the theme that artists follow throughout their career. And that said, I'd like to kind of build on this and share an iteration, building on some of the experiences that I've also had. So a key part of this adaption of this process is it draws on what is taught in art, because art is taught as a process. People don't just start in day one knowing how to do everything. Students are exposed to different methods at a foundation level, and then they find their paths. Each might have variations, but the core path more or less simmers down to these five steps. Inspiration, percolation, getting prepared, creation, and reflection. Most projects and in product, and also when you create art, have a discovery period. And in art, you're almost in a perpetual discovery period. You're gathering constantly into your sketchbook. If it's a particular project, you're gathering maybe the insights particular for that. The input is key. Maybe you go wide at the beginning, and then you narrow in. You are opening your mind and your brain to as many inputs as possible. So the next one is percolation. This is where you take all that great information and you distill it down. You plot it out. You decide what fits, what doesn't, trying it on for size. And from there, you might even need evidence, or you find out what sparks into research and even ideas. You're letting it sit with you. And then you are getting prepared. Setting up to paint something is almost a ritual experience for many artists. They will lay out their tools one by one, squeeze paints onto the palette waiting to be used. Then each brush is laid out, the water pulled into a pot. Then they sit, they breathe, and then they can begin. Being prepared is the breath at the start before you take a leap. Taking note of that is an important part of the creative process. And it's important to have at the beginning before creation, after discovery provides the flow. Sometimes creation looks like that tangle mess shared earlier, that messy middle. And that aha moment at times seems lost until you find it. We've all had that. But this can be calm, and it's often not the easiest process to go through. Having patience, though, when creating is key as you work through these options. And then finally, we end with reflection. This, in the previous example, was finish, but reflection fits as this ensures you get to the finish and pause. Checking before release and letting out that breath. Personally, and lots of people do this, they build a micro kind of creative loops from prepared to reflection into their processes. So they're kind of doing that little release cycles as well. So simpler frameworks, and there's going to be multiple different ones, might say uh, find and transform and share. But there are multiple ways to do this. And as I continue in this talk, you'll hopefully see how these can be expanded into your product work as well. A few important additions to this flow that I haven't directly called out yet, but I'm going to later, of evaluation, iteration, and adaption. These process loops often repeat, and baking in repeating loops is one way to ensure that these pro the processes build up towards release. You're gaining that information and you're iterating. In short, 
Artists' process vary, but the creative process exists and has a flow from start to finish. You don't just do the messy middle and then ta-da, it happens. So it's worth noting about processes that artists don't just day one get it. They don't just turn up knowing how to create a masterpiece. That's not how this works. Often the creative process is taught. In fact, most of the time it is. And even the creative vision or theme they're working on takes, as noted here in this study, up to 12 years to form. The expectation often when seeing a formed artist that this just happened is unfair. And likewise, we can't judge products or those making it on their first product or even their second or third iteration. We need to have that art and that practicing of products themselves. Just like art needs to be learned, so does making products. So often the term art practice is used to describe the way art is created. The practice is the way the work is gone about. But it goes beyond the doing and might influence the materials, the tools, and even the critical approach that happens. It includes intentions, choices, actions, and ways of working, and also processes. Forming a practice is key to an artist, and I would argue the same for anyone creating products. Sharing work early is a term often said in the work that we do, particularly within open source. In art, the practice of sketchbooks establishes and fosters this along with feedback. Much like working in a team or an open source project, sharing is and thinking is done in safe places that art establishes. In the first year when creating art, if you're being taught, you get to learn a wide range of foundations. You're trying on all these different mediums to see which ones or one might be the one that you want to try and practice. You're learning about them. You're trying them on to see. And then in the years later, you refine them to find the one or the collection of them that fit. This leads you to your final year, the final pieces, and you start to make the final steps towards what will be your art practice. It forms by trying on those range of different ones, not just by waking up and knowing that it happens. You don't just from day one go, aha, this is what I'm doing. You're practicing. Creating a product has a practice to it also. There are recognized disciplines, processes. Those making products also get vast benefits learning and listening to others. There are a lot of frameworks and flows. But today, I'm going to share the product flow that more or less simmers down what most typically use. It's worth noting that terms change for this. Countless blog posts and articles and theories have been written about this. But it kind of boils down to definition, ideation, preparation, creation, and testing. So it starts with definition. Here you are defining what you're creating. This is understanding, being aware of what doing. After all, when you walk into a room, you kind of assess the room before you walk forward. Often this can come from research, but it is where you start to be aware of the problem space. You fill those. As part of this, you define what there is and what there isn't. Jumping without into uh, this kind of phase into creating is adorable, absolutely, but often doesn't result in a clear product at the end. And we've all been there, absolutely, when we make products. We've all just jumped into just making. So this discovery session without a clear definition formed is essential. Then you have ideation. Ideation without definition is a clear differential between art and product. For example, in art, you often are defining for experimentation. With product due to resources, you're more likely to have a case proven before scheduled. From what tech you need to and what marketing campaign you're having, products need preparing for as you're creating. And you do this now before the flurry of creation. You're doing that preparation. And then creation. This is often after ideation, and I will note that how many product flows merge these two processes together. Many see creation as also prototyping. By calling it creation, ideation and prototyping are, and I feel personally, should be unique. Ideation goes wide, and prototyping hones in on the ideation that's actually the best one to go for. 
And then finally, the testing. I can't stress this enough, how important testing is in this flow. Often testing can be seen as a loop return back to the beginning. It's important to poke your hypothesis. More or less, that is a similar process to the creative process. But let's look where the distinct differences between creating art and products are, and then move on to finding where these more similar pieces are and when you can learn from them. The process of creating art and creating products is different, as I said. But Goldworthy is an artist that heavily inspires me. And this quote means a lot to me personally, because it differentiates between where I see product and art. There is a difference for me. That doesn't mean that there isn't a process. It means the reasons or the meaning of the piece. Even without a theory of the piece, there are still methods and practices. So Goldsworthy, the pieces that he creates are often in nature. And he needs to have and declare some really clear processes and structure to what he is creating. But the difference between products and art is that art can be created beautifully just because. A product has reasons. If it doesn't, it is well art. And that's OK. Art can take many, many different forms. Time being unimportant as a factor in art can often be a misconception. There are, however, different pressures absolutely on products and art. Often time is not on the product maker's side. The pressure of release looms, and the phrase time is money is often at the forefront. Compared to where in art, it often feels like uh, time can be taken where canvases can sit, wait, and inspiration can strike. Those creating products almost have to have inspiration on tap. Art could be said to be the expression of the artist. And if that is the case, then products are often delivered through data, an expression of a need. This doesn't mean art can't be created through data, far from it. It does mean that products, unlike art, typically respond to data and even iterate in versions after release. It isn't so typical to see that in art. Art tends to be released once without iterations, although some pieces do break that rule. So this slide sums up the key differences. Product is about getting the job done, achieving the need, and often the need is outlined in the customer diving, exploring the requirements. The reality is that pleasing isn't the only success metric, and sometimes being unpleasing can win if you get the job done. Art, on the other hand, has to connect in some way to the viewer. It doesn't have to please, often choosing to connect with a different emotion. But the connection can be a measure of success. But what can we learn where the paths cross? and where they are the same. Both art and product have principles and foundations to follow. We've talked about, and I've talked about the process, but even a loose creative process is one followed. When you create a product, probably the biggest thing you can do is not, uh, as in a problem, is not document your creation process. Establishing that and logging is key to refining how you make. I'd encourage trying other practices also on for size, seeing what might work along the way. Learn and establish with those creating your own product path, collaborating together. And as we move into this area, I want to focus on four areas in uh, particular where we can bring those practices into where we're making product. And these are be yourself, focus, process, and experiment. So being yourself as a product might seem a little bit peculiar to say when thinking about, but it's incredibly true. This is as much about being yourself as knowing when to be different enough and when to be blending in. USPs are great, and being cute can be cool, but it's also about being measured and appropriate. Overly cute when a problem arises and doesn't sit well with an experience flow doesn't always work. Even the Twitter farewell lost its appeal over time. Artists are often identified by their unique capabilities. Having a unique product idea might be hard, 
often difficult or often seems impossible in certain spaces, but having your own identity and voice and dealing with it is something to craft. Also be human. Generations have learned to see through corporate layers. The business cynicism is a reality now. Admit when you fail just enough, but don't overly emotion. This isn't an opportunity to overshare, and your product isn't your dear diary. Artists, by their nature of work, focus, often at the cost of the world around them. Whilst that approach isn't recommended to product making, what is needed is setting boundaries, a clear goal, a vision of what's creating, a roadmap and clarity of what releasing. It's ideal to set in focus times for creation. An existing product needs maintenance, promotion, and tending to. Nurturing, just like a garden, and just like a living being. This often means that finding creation focus is harder. Baking into product practice times for deep focus empowers what you are making. It also means flourishing of ideas and what ifs happens, and those growths of features. But of course, this also needs boundaries set to ensure you don't lose sight of that business that you are trying to achieve. But that deep product work is really key to also empower. Having a process for your product creation is really essential. There are so many different ones or variations that you can do. But how you create is going to depend on who you create with and what you are creating. A product without a process it's kind of an adorable collective creating without direction. Have that roadmap, follow and stick to it, but review and iterate, have check-ins, make sure you're aligned, respond to data and feedback. That is product making. And then ship. Shipping is incredibly important. That's part of product making. You repeat, you grow, you adapt with data and input. Repeat that cycle. If you create with others, you craft a process collectively, and you agree as part of your values. Establishing feedback sessions at all levels is critical. This can be at project, and it has to be at team, and also at leadership levels. By ensuring that the art of feedback is practiced throughout, you gain insights, and you can test through research. Feedback does need boundaries and training. Don't expect people to just be able to give feedback without direction. For example, when you ask for feedback, set questions out. Don't just ask for anything. Don't just post a link um, to a Figma or a link to something and say, feedback. That's not going to give you what you desire. Set questions, set context, maybe even do a quick little video. Within art, feedback is taught as a practice. Learn this craft because it will make you a better creator. And seek out opportunities for collaboration. Working in isolation can seem effective, but it only limits what you might be creating on your vision. Encouraging this across teams also if you form them. Different disciplines and different groups, just like artists, should be collaborating on a product. Collaboration unlocks so much. Artists often collaborate across their career and create pieces. These influence their own bodies of work. Learn from this. By creating and learning and collaborating with other product makers, you are going to be able to have other ideas for things that you can create as well. Art is often created in safe places, studio spaces. Having similar spaces to create products is essential. However you create, having a space for ideation to make and grow is key. This could be a virtual space as well. Don't have spaces where ideas die, though. Revisit and check on their pulse. Artists have sketchbooks, and products need similar spaces where explorations can happen. And if judgment happens too harshly, these ideas die really, really fast if critiqued before too shaped. That's why the concept of product sketchbook spaces is great giving opportunity of spaces where ideas can be formed, shaped, and then delivered into pitches. At that point, and at that point only, they should be judged, and judged with a criteria, just like when a sketchbook presentation happens for an artist. Experimentation is how artists learn both new techniques and try out approaches. 
you often find pages of a sketchbook filled out trying new materials like line by line, often experimenting with new forms. In product work, there also needs to be spaces for this, experimenting with new technology, experimenting with new adaptions as well, because that's how new ideas are going to flourish, by experimentation. It's also how practices can refine, just like the artist hones theirs. Play is critical in art, and allowing space to, as the previous slide said, for ideas, experimentation ideas can be separated. But an idea doesn't have to be formed to experiment and explore. You can just be trying something new, and you don't have to fully form it. There is a danger of experimentation without documentation, though, or conditions. Set some limits. And this means that you're going to have a positive result. If you just kind of experiment and then it goes to die, you're not necessarily going to feel fulfilled by that. Allow space for mistakes. Um, there's that phrase of happy accidents, but it opens up in the work of art and product. It's hard in product to not judge and see each failure as a concern or as a problem or as, as death of the product. However, often those happy accidents can be seen as opportunities to learn, to pivot, to adapt, maybe new ways to change things. Failure is both part of making an art and it should be part of making products. Knowing which to keep and this should be something that you practice. Knowing when to ship is key in product and often something miss. Often the end of point is due to a budget or a previously agreed deadline set in stone before the project begins. You need to bake in that discovery, and then you're going to be able to know when to ship, predict, and be able to deliver without stress. If you're making a product, there is a fine line in knowing when to release. And it's better to have a cadence that ensures that regular releases happen, and you don't have endless time without new shinies. However, for larger features, knowing when they are done, or when to stop and drop, is a large part of product craft. Just as an artist knows when a piece is about to be overworked, you need to know when you are adding too much, like this overworks ultimate Swiss Army knife. It's adorable, but it's completely usable. And yes, this is a real product that you can buy. You need to bake in when you need to let go of product features. And even if you are a company with multiple products that aren't serving well and getting in the way, Think about releasing them. It's OK to let go of a product that isn't serving you well. Sketchbooks and studios are full of pieces that won't be finished. Canvases are painted over because they don't serve a purpose anymore, and they're going to be better used and reworked as materials. Product work is as much about letting go as it is about refinement and creating. Every product has a life cycle. Creating and making is energy. You, by building something that you are by building something using energy that wasn't there, turning up their brightness, as this quote says. The cost of that energy is what you can set boundaries to by using those processes. Art has been created for many, many years, just like products, but it can teach us to keep that brightness levels up. Art and products do have more in common than we usually think. I think I, and I hope I've shared, how these processes can differ, but also can be similar. And I've explored how we can do that no matter what we are making and how we can bring those practices in. From idea to creation, we can bring principles and practices that work within art to improve our products. There is art in product creation. Making products has a cycle, a craft. Honing that craft, practicing and refining is what makes products that not only get the job done, that empower beyond that first ship, that create companies where feedback flows, experimentation and ideation flourish, and shipping is fuel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Tammy? Come up to the mic if you have any questions, and don't be shy. Tammy says she doesn't expect questions. I would love questions. And I think that we should give her some questions. 
Uncle Jared. Come on up to the mic. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> Hello, can Hi. you hear me? Uh, great talk. So I wanted to ask you because I was creating a lot of art. I was writing, I was um, making drawings, making cartoons, making movies, but I also work as a product designer. So one big difference is how do you stay focused and keep your artistic sensibility and pair that with the need for deep execution and controlled execution when you have, for example, when you're working on a big project, you know, that feels more like just tedious work. <laughs> Which bit feels tedious? The product design? Yeah, the product <laughs> design and the whole thing. Maybe you're developing, you're creating something bigger, you know, and at yeah. some point it's just about the, the pure execution of it, you know, the so one of the things for me, and this is going to be very personal, is by bringing the way that I create art into the way that I create products. Um, that helps me keep focused. Also telling myself at the end I can create art really helps. Give me myself that creative cookie. Um, I think by give it, breaking it down into those processes, you are delivering pieces of work in your artwork, right? You are creating something, you're iterating and releasing, but you are doing that and you're going through tedious processes, but you're not feeling it's tedious because you are passionate and loving and appreciating that. So what you have to kind of do, which is not easy, <laughs> but it's kind of part of it, is to bring some of those enjoyable practices into your product making practices. I know that sounds incredibly simple, but that, that would be my rec kind of recommendation there. Thank you. And, Any other questions? and also I would say, don't be afraid to bring your sketching into your product work. If you're not doing that already, think how you can cross over your sketching and your artwork into your product design. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> okay, well, that's it for the first sesh of the, sec of the afternoon, day one. We do wanna remind you all to grab swag. It's from the information desk right in the middle of the entire building. Uh, so do grab swag, there's a lot. And then there is a walking tour this afternoon if you guys are interested. Um, we're meeting at Piazza Castello, sorry. Um, and the first 13, 13 spots are free. You can still join, but you just have to pay. So you're meeting at 5.30, 15.30. So that's it for the sesh. You guys have a good time.